your Bibles, turn with me to Isaiah chapter 55. We're going to back up a few verses. We're going to start at verse 1. Isaiah chapter 55, verse 1. Ho, everyone that thirsts come to the waters, and he that has no money come, buy and eat. Yea, come, but buy wine and milk without money and without price. Why do you send money for that which is not bread? And your labor for that which satisfies not. Hearken diligently unto me, and eat that which is good, and let your soul delight itself in fatness. Incline your ear, and come unto me. Hear, and your soul shall live, and I will make an everlasting covenant with you, even the sure mercies of David. Behold, I have given him for a witness to the peoples, a leader and commander to the peoples. Behold, I shall call a nation that thou knowest not, and nations that knew not this shall run unto thee because of the Lord thy God and for the Holy One of Israel. For he has glorified thee. Seek ye the Lord while he may be found. Call upon the Lord while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts, and let him return unto the Lord, and he will have mercy upon him, and to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are my ways your ways, saith the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are the, my ways than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. For as the rain comes down, and the snow from heaven and returns not there, but waters the earth, and makes it bring forth and bud, and it may give seed to the sower and bread to the, to the eater. So shall my word be that goes forth out of my mouth. It shall not return unto me void, but it shall accomplish that which I please, and it shall prosper in all, thy, in all things whether to I send it. And we would ask as we read the scriptures and study it this morning that God would open our hearts and minds uh, and teach us from the word of God today through the Holy Spirit and encourage us in our faith. And let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we are grateful again that we can come into your presence through the shed blood of Jesus Christ. Now, Father, we thank you that you have provided free access to yourself through the shed blood and the forgiveness of sins. And we're clothed in the righteousness of Christ and we thank you, Father, that we can come this morning boldly to the throne of grace. Father, we come this morning with praise and adoration and thanksgiving for who you are and what you're doing in our lives and the privilege we have to serve you here at Cornerstone. Father, we come with many needs this morning. I pray for those that are here this morning that are struggling uh, financially and physically and otherwise, but they've come out this morning to to meet with us, Lord, and we thank you for that. We pray for some that aren't able to come out this morning, and I lift them up to you today. I have quite a few that are sick and going through physical issues, and I just pray, God, that even now your Holy Spirit would be giving them comfort and peace and healing, uh, our, 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 our loved ones. And, Father, we just thank you again that we can come and that we can study your word and be taught from the word of God this morning, and we can sing your praises. And we just ask, Father, that, our presence this morning is pleasing to you. We thank you again for your love and your watch care and your goodness. In Jesus' name, amen. For our visitors this morning, we've been talking about evangelism, the Great Commission over the last several months, really since the first of the year, God sort of put me on that track about reaching out to this community and sharing Christ with those in need. And the Great Commission, as we've looked, is not an option, it's a command. And it's not to be left to pastors and deacons or the Billy Grahams of the world. Uh, it's unanimous. We're all told to go into the world and preach the gospel to every living creature. Amen. We call it the gospel, the good news. In the last several weeks, we've been asking ourselves, what, it's, what is it really about? You know, it's, uh, we all like good news, don't we? 
Uh, I remember the first time my wife told me she was pregnant. That was scary good news, <laughs> if you know what I mean. It was good news, but I was terrified of it, to tell you the truth. But what do we really preach? You know, it's, it's, of course, we all like to boil it down. I'm a bottom line kind of guy, right? We're sinners. We need to be saved. Christ died on the cross, shed his blood so I can have forgiveness of sin and be saved. Amen? You know, I just need to repent and trust that, right? And that's, that's kind of, we all, we all like grab a hold of that, and somewhere in our repertoire of witnessing, that's how we present the gospel in a short nutshell, right? Now, as I've taught in the past about, to people about evangelism, and I'm always convinced, I've just been my, my own experience, that the best testimony you have is what God did in your life. And you need to understand that to the point that you can present that. I say you need a, about a minute and a half to two minute presentation of how God changed your life by saving you. And then you need one probably about 15, 20 minutes in case you have time to really, you know, get into it and add some scripture and do all those kinds of things. But in witnessing, I believe we need to be prepared. And as we've been talking about in, from Isaiah here, 55, we've been spending time between verse 6, really in verse 11, uh, talking about that we're to seek the Lord in verse 6 while he may be found and call upon him while he's near. Give me the, the first slide there, guys. You know, as we talk about the, the gospel, it basically is the word of God, right? And it's, it's, it's a lot depending on who you're talking to and where they are in their life. Uh, you know, I've, I've spent as much as two years or more in the process of witnessing to the same person over and over and over again and answering questions and different things as they're making that descent, if you will, from, from their own pride and their haughtiness down to the fact that realizing they're a sinner and need to be saved. And uh, I, I look at my parents. I mean, I, we prayed for them for 40 45 years, and my dad literally was 91 to get saved. So you never give up. You never, you never stop praying. You never stop witnessing as long as somebody has breath. Amen? And so ultimately, as we, as we witness, we have to witness where they are. And I believe the more you know about the Word of God, the more you understand about the God that we serve, the love that we talked about in our men's Bible study yesterday, real men love God, and we talked about what does that mean. We learned real quick it's a big topic. It isn't something we do by nature. It's something that only comes when you get saved and the, shed of, the, the, the love of Christ is shed abroad in your heart, and then you can return that love to him through the Holy Spirit. And we talked so, about that some with the men yesterday. But these are all issues that we talk about how to witness. And as I've been playing with this whole idea, everybody that you witness to has a different way that they're going to respond. You know, one of the things I learned in sales years ago, you start off by qualifying by asking rhetorical questions. And you qualify. In real estate, it was how much, how soon, how much money have you got, you know, you know what do you got to sell first. You have to ask all these questions to qualify them to see whether they're ready, willing, and able to buy or not. So you, you use rhetorical questions. And I believe that you start off witnessing in most cases, that's where you start. You've got to ask questions. You've got to find out where they come from. And your presentation should be accordingly. Once you've qualified them, find out, oh, they were raised in church, and then they fell away, and they never got saved, and, and whatever their issues were, uh, you know, you, you find out where they are, and then you try to start meeting those needs. Some people, it's all about love. They spent their whole life without being loved. And we represent the God of love, amen? So you need to present that. God is a God of love. You know, uh, some people are, you, you get them in calamity. God meets their needs. Some of them are going through financial trouble. We, we worship the God that has the cattle on a thousand hills, right? Can you meet their financial needs? So maybe that's the, the, the approach to bring them to Christ, the Christ that can meet their needs. 
So maybe it's physical. You, there's a lot of issues, and, and I w I'm going to make my point here in a minute on why I believe as we're witnessing to people, we've got to meet them where they are. Because in my experience over the years, that's where God meets people, is right where they are. God is good about bringing us to our knees, isn't he, uh, is he not, to reach us? You know, get you to the end of the rope. You have no more answers, and there's God. Amen? So I think we have to be discerning on how we witness to people. Give me, give me the next slide. Look at verse 1 here, and, I, you know, you have to, I have to apologize to you. Sometimes words nail me, and I can't get past them for a while. And the first word here of chapter 55, verse 1 of Isaiah says, Ho! How many know what that means? Good, I don't feel so bad. I've studied this scripture for years. I've taught from this scripture, and I've never really, that word has never hit me till this week. Ho. Actually, in the Hebrew, it's hoy, H-O-Y. And I thought, what in the world does that mean? He says, ho, everyone that thirsts come. And that's at the heart that's at the heart of the gospel. Brother Bobby was talking about it in, in Sunday morning, Sunday school this morning, and if you're not coming out to Sunday school, I recommend you try it. Bobby does a good job. I'm going to be teaching some things on family here in a couple weeks and, uh, from Ephesians chapter 5, so if you want to enhance your marriage, you need to come out and sit in on that. But we have a great Sunday school here. Carol's got her class in the back. We've got young people, young adults. We've got some great teachers, so I, I recommend you come out to Sunday school. But Bobby was talking about... Uh, uh, from, from the Old Testament, how Adam and Eve, when they sinned in the garden, it broke fellowship with the Father. Okay? It broke fellowship. And the gospel is really an invitation to come. That word ho, just so you, give me the next slide, that word ho here, basically to keep in context the, the previous the verses we've been preaching about, the context goes back to verse 1. He talks about, you know, we're to call upon him when he's near, while he can be found. Verse 6, we've been talking about that. Okay? But the reality is it's a call to come, starting verse 1. He says, if you're thirsty, come to me. If you're hungry, come to me. If you're in need. Come to me. That word ho is a is a is kind of like uh, hey. Get your attention. Is what ho means. Now the 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 Hebrew word is used a hundred and some times. Uh, give me the give me the next slide. I need to get to my definition here. Okay. The next, give me the next one. I want to I'm going to move past some of this stuff here. Here it is. Uh, ho is used uh, thirty six times. It's ah. Three, only three times it's ho, two times it's alas. Now notice this next statement here. Basically, it's negative most of the time throughout the prophets, the word is translated woe, is negative. When you see that word hoy in the Hebrew, it's translated woe. Now what does woe mean? Stop, look out, beware. This is exact opposite. This is, hey, pay attention. This is important. Ho, oh, pay attention. Wake up. Come. That's how this is translated here. This is what, this is what Isaiah is saying here to, to God's people. Come. So when, you're, when we go witnessing and we're, we're talking about evangelism, going out and presenting the gospel, we're giving an invitation for them to come to the God of the universe and his son, Jesus Christ, who died for them, our Savior and the King of glory, amen? So that needs to be, bottom line, your approach when you're coming. When, when you go out to witness, you're, you're offering an opportunity for people to come to Christ. And it's a welcome invitation. He's offering right here, he's offering about, you know, when you thirst. Look what he says here, verse 1. Everyone that thirsts, come to the waters. 
course, we can jump over to, to uh, John's gospel, right? Where, uh, where he was talking to the woman at the well. And what did he say? I give you living water. He talks about your, 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 out of your soul will flow rivers of living water because of Christ. Remember, Jesus Christ was the rock of Horeb that brought water in the desert to the Israelites. So he, he says, when you're thirsty, come to me. He says, when you're hungry, come to me. Even when you don't have any money to buy, it's okay. I'll provide for you. And then he says, well, why are you spending money on stuff you, that doesn't, <laughs> doesn't accomplish anything? You know, one of the things we deal all the time in is, 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 is a church when people come with benevolence. Uh, we look at that and we want to meet those needs, but at the same time, we try our best to, to give some accountability somewhere. You know, if they're out blowing all their money on stuff they shouldn't be blowing it on, but then they need us to help pay their electric bill, that's a whole different issue. You know, we might need to rein in why they're spending money on stuff they shouldn't be spending it on. So a lot of, a lot of truths here as you get into this. But anyhow, Jesus says, come to me. That's the message of the gospel. It's the invitation to come to Christ, the invitation to come and restore your relationship with God Almighty. It's broken because you're a sinner and you haven't repented and let him forgive you of your sins and clothe you in the righteousness of Christ. And consequently, he says, come. Give me the next slide. Now, we've looked at this last week real briefly, and I want to run back to him just real quick. And I've added the word ho to it. Because I believe all of these are important when you're witnessing. These are all approaches that you can use, all right? He said, ho to the woman at the well. Is anyone thirsty? Come unto me. I'll give you living water. And we, we could spend a lot of time teaching on this. Jesus went to the, the Samaritan woman. The fact that a rabbi, Jewish rabbi was talking to a woman to start with is, is, wasn't culturally uh, acceptable. The fact that he was in Samaria, Jews didn't go in Samaria because they were the half-breeds that walked 30 miles out around Samaria that, rather than walk through Samaria. And what did Christ tell his disciples? I must needs go to Samaria. So he went to Samaria deliberately to meet her. And then he's drinking after, asking to drink after her, which was unheard of. I mean, we go on and on about who he was witnessing to and why. He broke all the rules that the, that the Pharisees had about witnessing. He told her all about her life. Of course, that's an advantage Jesus has that we don't have, right? That's why we need to do rhetorical questions. He didn't have to do that. He already knew her life. But he led her to Christ, and then she becomes an evangelist immediately and runs back and gets all the guys to come out of town, and they all got saved too. So, you know, that's the, the duplication of, of evangelism, a lot learned in this story. But the bottom line, what did Christ say to her? Come. Come to me. And I'll give you water, I'll give you the thirst, I'll quench your thirst, and I'll give you water that'll never run dry. So we see this invitation to come to Christ in the, the woman at the well. Give me the next slide. We talked about the little coming as a little child. And I added this, I said, Ho, oh, is anybody arrogant or proud come to Jesus as a little child? You know, that, that's one of the issues I like about dealing with young people because usually they don't have the arrogance and pride and it's much easier to reach young people for Christ than when they get older and they think they know it all and they don't need Jesus anymore and then it's harder to reach them that's why over 80 percent of the people that get saved get saved under the age of 16 because they're pliable the, the best the best time to reach them is when they're about eight or nine and they're impressionable, and, and they just want to go be with Jesus, and they want to spend their eternity with mommy and daddy in heaven and granddaddy in heaven or whatever. And, and, you know, young people get saved so easy because they don't have all this pride and stuff. Jesus says, come unto me as a little child. I hope you're familiar. I'm sure you're familiar with that scripture. Okay? I, I'm convinced that every one of us, if we're going to get saved, have to surrender ourselves as a little child. I love, the, I love the fact when my daughters were young and, you know, you could grab them and, and I, I'm sure Gary doesn't do this with his granddaughter, but you throw them up in the air and then you catch them and they giggle. Do it again, Dad, do it again. And you throw them up in the air and you catch them. And all that's trust. And they, they, they trust you as their dad. 
And that's really what salvation's about. As we trust Christ, we jump into his arms and we trust him to meet our needs and take us to glory. Amen? It's really simple. Salvation is simple to present. Give me the next slide. Ho, oh, come unto me, all you labor and heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. Is that an approach for witnessing? Absolutely. You're going to run into people that have need. And on one hand, while you're helping meet that physical need or emotional need, you present the gospel to them. That's the perfect time. I think of the, of the people that you go to. I, I, I got to confess to you. I struggle. I have to do it because I'm a pastor, but I'm not. I struggle with hospital visits. And even worse, I struggle with nursing home visits because it depresses me. When I had, even when my mom and dad both spent time in, nurse, in nursing homes, and I had to go spend time with them, it depresses me. It's hard for some guys, some people have that gift. I don't. Okay? But I know the value when somebody's laying there in that bed and they're almost to the point of being helpless and they have need and you can go there and hold their hand and pray for them and share Christ with them and sometimes they're unsaved and sometimes that's what it takes for God to reach them okay when they're really in need and God is the great physician he's the healer he's the one that handles our pain for us and tells us he'll never put us through more than we can handle I mean there's so much scripture that we can give people in these types of needs and he says when you're in need when you're in labor and you're heavy laden come to me and that's the invitation of salvation again see so we need to be cognizant of these different approaches that we can use in salvation and I'm all about being diplomatic being uh, in, in, informed being discerning on how we approach salvation and all of these are approaches and we went through them last week give me the next slide the invitation here is an eternal call we spent time talking about God's ways and God's thoughts that's critical to salvation in my opinion you know the Bible says that through the foolishness of preaching God saves people Preaching is foolishness to those that perish, right? But to us that are saved, it's what? The power of God. Say it with me. The power of God unto salvation. Okay? That's what preaching is to God. He uses the foolish things to confound the wise. So, you know, we have to learn to present the gospel the way God wants it presented. Uh, it, 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 it flies in the face of, of, of human comprehension most of the time. Okay? So we have to present the gospel the way God tells us to present it. It's by faith that we get saved. It's, a, it's an eternal call. Give me the next slide. We talked about several weeks ago about it being a free gift, and we love that idea and all the stuff that goes with it. And I don't want to spend a lot of time here. Okay? I want to get to this point I want to make this morning. For, salvation is free. But as Brother Bill's quick to point out, it costs you everything, right, Bill? You know, salvation is free, but we've surrendered our lives to serve Christ. We become a bondservant, a bond slave, the Apostle Paul says, to Christ. Amen? First, Second Corinthians says, therefore, if any man is Christ, he's a new creation. Old things pass away, all things become new. I'll be honest with you, I've some of, seen some of you get saved in this church, and you're really strange now. <laughs> You know, to the good, right? The world thinks we're weird, right? Let's face it. We're those Bible-thumping Christians. I mean, heavens. Uh, but it's, it's that free gift that we have to offer to other people. And that free gift is the invitation to come to Christ and be saved, right? Give me the next slide. Something the Lord's been really beating on me for the last couple of weeks. And I, the more I watch... I have to be real careful. I can't turn on TV and watch most preachers on TV because of what I'm going to point out to you. And, and just this morning, I flipped on TV and I had to turn it off because I couldn't listen to the guy. And I don't want to give you any names, but I couldn't listen to the guy. 
because of this right here. I think we've got a problem in Christianity today in how we are presenting the gospel to the unsaved world in a big way. Okay? I, think, I don't think we're being honest in many areas with the gospel. Now, I don't want you to get me wrong. Salvation is a wonderful thing. It's the best thing I ever did was give my life to Christ. Okay? No question about it. And the hopes that we have, eternal life, and the promises we have, and, the, and being able to serve him in this life and have him, the Holy Spirit, work through you and, and in you and all the stuff that goes on with salvation, there is nothing better. So I want to clarify that right out front. Okay? I'm not putting down being saved here. Okay? And, and I'm, I'm going to say this. There's nothing more exciting than serving him with your life. Nothing more exciting that to watch God work in other people's lives through your feeble efforts, okay? And, and when you've been doing it like Patty and I for 45 years and you see, you know, little kids get saved and they grow up, now they're pastors and whatever they're doing, and you go, wow, you know. And you had a little piece of that when they were in your youth group, little snot-nosed kid back then, I, you know. Um, I told a 45-year-old guy that was in my youth group years ago that he's still a snot-nosed kid. He's just an older snot-nosed kid to me. But, you know, when, when you watch God use you over the years like that, there's nothing greater than that, okay? So I'm all about being saved, and I'm all about serving Christ with your life. It's, it's why we're here, okay? But I don't believe we're being honest with the gospel, and here's why. Give me the next slide. It's good news, right? But the next slide will... Give me the next slide, then. Is it a bed of roses? No? Really? Turn to 2 Timothy chapter. Turn to 2 Timothy chapter 3. This, this whole text in 2 Timothy is not fun. I've got verse 12 here, but I want to start at verse 1. Because this is the world we're in. This know also that in the last days perilous times shall come. For men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those things that are good. Suppose Paul was living today. Does that sound like the world we live in today? You mean that stuff was going on in Paul's day too? He says in the last days, this is where we're at. Suppose we're in the last days. Verse 4, traitors, heady-minded, lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying the power of it. From such turn away. Now jump down to verse 12. Let's start at verse 11. Persecutions, afflictions, which came unto me at Antioch, at Iconium, at Lystra. What persecutions I endured, but out of them all the Lord delivered me. Yea, and all, get this now, if you don't have this underlined in your Bible, you need to underline it. Yea, and all that will live godly in Christ shall live in a bed of roses. Not what your Bible says? What's it say in here? It doesn't even say might suffer persecutions. This is an imperative. You know, there is far too much going on today in Christendom about telling people, love Jesus and everything's going to be wonderful. Really? You know, I tell our men in leadership all the time, a guy comes and starts coming to leadership, and the first thing I tell him is, you better, be, better, better prepare yourself. Tighten up your bootstraps. Right, Doug? The minute you want to step into leadership, guess who Satan doesn't like anymore? I mean, he doesn't worry about Christians aren't doing anything for Jesus. 
I know it isn't. I know it isn't. It's women too. You want to serve Christ with your life? Satan's going to turn up the heat on you. Amen? I mean, I, we've got a lot of people here serve. You know, right? Are we being dishonest when we try to witness to people and tell them if they get saved, everything to be wonderful? We're being dishonest to them. We're being dishonest to them. Now, again, don't get me wrong. Salvation is wonderful, and there's nothing better than knowing that no matter what happens in my life, I die and go to glory. And yes, it's no more pain and no more sorrow and no more sickness and all that stuff in glory. But in this life, don't be dishonest in your witness. I mean, I can't turn on TV and listen to these guys without hearing about, you know, you're going to be richer and healthy and wealthy. And this guy this morning was, come get your miracle. Be healed. Really? Is that my message in the cross today is come and be healed? Come and be saved. And then if God heals you, praise Jesus. But God doesn't heal everybody. You know God wants sick people in the church? He, he wants sick people in the church to teach us to meet their needs. He wants poor people in the church. He says the poor will always be with you. Okay? That teaches us to minister to them. That humbles us. Makes me get out my checkbook and write some checks. That's some money in other people's lives that need it. See? In some cases, he, heal people. he heals people. He does both. That's part of his providence. But our message is not always about a, a bed of roses. Give me the next slide. Turn to 2 Corinthians. Second Corinthians chapter 1, start of verse 1. Paul called to be an apostle of Jesus Christ through the will of God and Sosthenes, our brother, unto the church of God, which is at Corinth, to them that are sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints with all that in every place call upon the name of Jesus, our Lord, both theirs and ours. Grace be unto you and peace from God our Father, from the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God always on your behalf for the grace of God which is given you by Jesus Christ, that in everything you are enriched by him in, in, in all utterance and in all knowledge, even as the testimony of Christ was confirmed in you. That's not the scripture I want. I'm not sure where the scripture is I wanted. The scripture that I wanted talks about we will partake of the sufferings of Christ. Is it verse 5? Everything you're enriched by him. To, you know. Oh, wait a minute. I'm in 1 Corinthians. That's my problem. Okay. Wrong book. Sorry about that. Knew it wasn't right. Verse 5 and 6. For the sufferings of Christ abound in us, so our consolation also abounds by Christ. And whether we are afflicted, it is for your consolation and salvation, which is effectual in the enduring of the same sufferings which you also suffer, or whether we are comforted, it is for your consolation and salvation. What's that saying here? That's saying, folks, we are going to suffer. And it's to grow us. It's to make us more comfortable, if you will, in Christ. You want your faith to grow? Be persecuted. You want your faith to grow? Struggle some. And watch him work. See? And I think we've got to be honest with people when we go out and share Christ. It can't be this wonderful bed of roses, and they get saved, and then they get blindsided. And then where are they in their faith? See? And that's what's going on in Christianity today in America. We want to we so paint it pretty 
that we're not being honest with people. The Apostle Paul, godly man, wrote two-thirds of the New Testament. We're going to get to him in a minute. What's the message? Give me the next slide. Come unto me, deny yourself. We talk, we, I preached on this last week. Deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow me. Now, is that talking about everything being wonderful? What's the cross about here? We're to take up, he says, my, pick up my yoke. My yoke is easy because he's going to help us carry it. But it's a yoke. We're to be bound to him. We're to be yoked with him. We're to pick up our cross. He struggled to get it down to Via Della Rosa. He had to have help to get it to, the, to Calvary. See? So are we talking about Christianity being a light, uh, happy, go lucky man, here I am having fun in Jesus? I mean, I, I watch some of this stuff on, on, on TV in different places, and I see some of this they call praise and worship, and I go, really? Really? Give Jesus a hand? Really? I, 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 maybe it's just me. Am, am I out to lunch here? No. I don't, I, I'm not sure Jesus wants our hands. I, I mean, clapping. I'm not sure that's what he wants. I think he'd much rather have me on my face before him. In humility. You know, my Bible talks about that he enjoys a broken and contrite heart. See? And I think we got it all wrong today. We're way too much to overhear, you know, about praise Jesus, hallelujah, you know, having fun and, and entertaining ourselves. And we're not broken before the Holy God. And when you get saved, in my experience, most, most people I've seen as a pastor over the years, it's a struggle. It's a struggle dealing with me, number one, being what I should be. And it's a struggle just getting through this life and sacrificing what ordinarily goes on in life, which, fine, you go make a lot of money, play toys, you know, enjoy yourself, whatever. But instead, God wants you to sacrifice yourself and serve him in the lives of others. I, I, I'm going to say this tongue-in-cheek. I say it. I, I don't say it to offend anybody, but I say it all the time. Ministry would be really f a lot of fun if you didn't have to put up with people. Anybody know what I mean? Give me an amen. <laughs> you know, I mean, I love you guys. I really do. So am I, I'm sure. <laughs> we all are. We're all a lot of work, you know. But that's what it's about. That's where your joy, that's where your excitement come from in, in ministry. is caring for one another and loving one another and helping one another and encouraging one another, bearing one another's burdens. It's all about one another. Amen? But it isn't always fun. And I don't think we should give that approach that idea to new believers or people we're witnessing to that if you get saved, everything will be wonderful. Their life may not change. It might even get worse. I mean, you know, think of the lady you lead to Christ and her husband's an unsaved jerk. What do you think is going to happen to her life when she comes home and tells him, I just got saved and gave my life to Jesus and want to go to church next week? You think her life's going to get better? Hello? I mean, you know, now, now she's unequally yoked with that jerk. <laughs> you know? If she's going to try to serve Christ, it's going to be a struggle. So don't, don't paint this rosy picture that you're going to get saved and, man, everything will be wonderful at home. He's still going to be a jerk. The only difference is now you have Jesus Christ and the power of Christ to try to help you deal with that jerk. Okay. So we, we've got to be careful with this. Give me the next slide. Again, we're to take up our cross. He says, I'll quench your thirst. 
I'll feed you. I'll provide for you. But the invitation is take up your cross. Keep it balanced. Is it just me or is it serving Christ a lot of work at times? Long hours. Inconvenience. Dropping what you're doing and going and doing what he wants you to do instead. Doing things that aren't fun. I'll be honest with you. Standing at the bedside of a, love, of a dying saint is not fun to me. It's not. And it's even worse trying to witness to an arrogant person that doesn't want to hear it. That's not fun. But God's got you witnessing to him. It's not fun. Rejecting everything you're saying. Thinking you're a total nut. Give me the next slide. Anybody already heard of this guy? The voice of the one crying in the wilderness. Prepare ye the way of the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for God. Isaiah prophesied that 650 years before John the Baptist ever came on the scene. He said, I'm going to send a man that's going to prepare the way for my Messiah. There's going to be one crying in the wilderness. Israel, Israel had not heard of a pro, from a prophet in over 400 years when, when John came. John came with the message, Behold, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Call of God, God's man for that time and that place to set the stage for the coming of Messiah. John the Baptist. Give me the next slide. I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance, but he who is coming after me is mightier than I, whose sandals I am not worthy to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. And fire. That was the message of John the Baptist. He knew his message. He was on. We, today we'd say he was on point. Right? He was on point with his evangelism. You know, keep in mind he was the cousin of Jesus and the second cousin, I guess, and probably heard the story about him being in his mother's womb and leaping in her womb when Mary showed up. <laughs> you know. So he knew. He knew Messiah was coming right behind him. Give me the next slide. He was the one that baptized Jesus. He was the one that says, I'm not even worthy to tie his shoelaces, let alone baptize him. He says, I'm the one that must decrease so he can increase. John the Baptist. Give me the next slide. Truly I say unto you, this is Jesus talking about John. Truly I say unto you, among those born among women, there has not risen anyone greater than John the Baptist, yet the one who is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. He's saying John the Baptist is a godly man. There's never been a more godly man than my man John. Doesn't that sound great? Doesn't that sound like a success story? Give me the next slide. John ends up imprisoned by King Herod because he had the audacity to tell King Herod that uh, he shouldn't be have an adulterous relationship with his sister-in-law. He was committing adultery. And during his imprisonment, John even questioned if Jesus was truly the Messiah. That's how depressed he was. Does that sound like fun? This is God's called servant, John the Baptist. 
prophesied hundreds of years before God called him onto the planet. Saw Jesus in the waters of baptism. Heard the Holy Spirit talk about Jesus. You know, this is my son in whom I'm well pleased. And now here he is in prison for preaching the gospel faithfully. And he's even to the point in depression that he's questioning whether Jesus actually is Messiah or not. That's a low point. Give me the next slide. While he was in prison, Christ sent him words of this by the disciples and said, Go and report to John what you hear and see. The blind receive sight and the lame walk. The lepers are cleansed and the deaf hear. The dead are raised up and the poor have the gospel preached to them. Blessed is he who does not take offense at me. Give me the next slide. Just quoted the Old Testament scripture in Isaiah chapter 35. It says, To them that are of the fearful heart, be strong, fear not. Behold, your God will come with vengeance. Even God with a recompense, he will come and save you. Then the eyes of the blind shall be opened, and the ears of the deaf shall be unstopped. Then shall the lame man leap as a heart, and the tongue of the dumb sing. For in the wilderness shall the waters break out in the streams of the desert. And John knew that scripture. So Jesus is com com comforting him, basically telling him, John, I am Messiah. <laughs> he didn't come right out and say it. He just quoted the Old Testament. So John would know. Give me the next slide. That was John the Baptist's demise. Right after Jesus told him, I'm Messiah. Keep your faith, John. John lost his head. Martyred by King Herod. All for the cause of Christ. For the cause of Christ. You know how many Christians are being martyred every day right now on the, on, on the earth? And we're oblivious to it, most of it. This, this is not something new. Of course, it's old back then, but it's going on today in certain areas of the world. Give me the next slide. I mentioned the Apostle Paul, Saul of Tarsus. You know, you all know the story, saved on the road to Damascus. I'm running out of time here. I want to run through this. Same idea. God saved Saul for a specific purpose to go to the Gentiles and be the evangelist to the Gentiles. God met him individually on the road to Damascus. He was going to round up Christians. To, he had letters from the Pharisees to round up Christians, take them back to Jerusalem so they'd stand trial and probably are going to be martyred. And that's where Paul was headed. We all know the story. He was blinded on the road to Damascus. He saw Jesus, and Jesus said, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? And Saul became Paul of Tarsus. Okay? Saul of Tarsus became Paul of Tarsus. Okay? Fell to the ground, heard the voice saying, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? Give me that slide. Paul's response, who are you, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom thou, who thou art persecuting. It is hard for you to kick against the goats. He says, Paul, listen, I'm God. You're not. <laughs> I, got a, I got a job for you to do. Stop kicking against me. Serve me. Paul gets saved, right? 
the next slide. This is when Saul was in Stephen Stoning. Saul was holding the coast while they stoned Stephen. That's what he was saved from. He was the chief persecutor of the church of that day. And that's what he was saved from. Right? Give me the next slide. He was considered a fool by his fellow Hebrews. Five times he received 39 stripes. Twice he was beaten with rods. Once he was stoned and left for dead. He was shipwrecked on the way to Rome, spent a night and a day in the deep, in peril for his life constantly, weary, hungry, thirsty, cold, and naked. Paul wrote most of the epistles from prisons, either in Philippi or Rome. Does that sound like a bed of roses? Really? You get a point? And again, don't get me wrong. Salvation is great. But I think we have to be careful how we present it. I never want this pulpit to present it to the point that you get saved and everything would be wonderful. Praise God if it is, but the odds are it's not what I've seen in my life in the life of my brothers and sisters in Christ. And I really don't see it in Scripture. I really don't. Okay, slide. There he is. Paul was beheaded. Wrote two thirds of the New Testament. Spent time in Philippian jail, Roman jail. Beaten and left for dead. Lost his head. For Christ. So, the point I want to close with this morning, folks, when you go out and witness, don't paint a rosy picture that's not true. Be honest with people. We serve the God that delivers from debauchery, and then we're called to live in debauchery for those people that were to be in the world, but what? Not, not of it. The world's not going to change. If anything, the heat's going to be turned up against you because now you're anti-world. So don't paint this rosy picture. We've got to be honest with the gospel. The gospel is good news. But don't mislead it. Don't oversell it. You come to Christ, I can do all things what? Through, Through Christ who strengthens me. See? Bobby pointed out this morning with Paul with his thorn in the flesh and what did Christ tell him? My grace is sufficient. My grace is sufficient. That's how you present the gospel to people. So, I always, when I close the invitation to come to Christ, I always take it to Romans chapter 12, verse 1 and 2. That you present your body a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable unto God. Okay? Be not conformed to this world, but what? Be transformed by the renewing of your mind you may present yourself perfect will of God. Okay? That's the message. Preach the gospel. But preach it honestly. Father, we thank you for the message this morning. God, I pray for those that were listening to this God this morning. What a rosy picture he was painting. And, uh, it, you know what, Lord, it, it burdened me sitting there listening to it. I had to turn it off. I pray that God will be real with the gospel of Christ. We love the gospel. We love the good news. But Lord, we know serving you, we shall suffer persecution. We will be partakers of the sufferings of Christ. We're going to live in a lost and dying world that doesn't like what we're going to preach. Lord, we know that your son told us that they're going to hate us because they first hated him. So, 
Father, let us be mindful of the gospel that delivers from these things. Not necessarily in this life, but certainly in the life to come. And Father, we're called to serve you. And I pray that we'll serve you honestly in love without hypocrisy. And Father, we want you to get the glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Mm -hmm.